Hello everyone, welcome. We are beginning our new unit. Uh, this time we're gonna be talking about harmony and how harmony develops uh, in kind of two different eras and two different time periods. Uh, the first time period that we're gonna be dealing with mostly is going to be the classical era. Uh, in fact, we're gonna study the works of three composers that make up what we call the first Viennese school. Um, interestingly enough, the first Viennese school, which is comprised of uh, the composers Franz Joseph Haydn, we've checked out one of his string quartets before, um, Mozart, again, we've checked out one of his string quartets, uh, his first movement of his symphony number no. 40, in addition to some other pieces we'll uh, discover later on in the semester, um, and lastly, Ludwig von Beethoven, um, who we have also studied, of course, his very famous Fifth Symphony. Um, so those three composers make up what we call the first Viennese school, and they are three distinct composerly voices who uh, really embodied what we call functional or tonal harmony. Before I get too far into this subject, the thing that you should have with you, as always, is my one page that I made for you. Ta-da! It's in my notebook, but it's also in Dropbox for you. Um, <clears throat> we're only going to be talking about three different pieces by, um, uh, for today's lecture, one by each of the composers that I mentioned, but we're going to talk about a lot of terminology ahead of time. So um, for what's written on that one page, there's going to be a lot of explanation on, on my part. So let's go ahead and start. Uh, like I said, first Viennese school, we're talking about three composers that were interested in what we call tonal or functional harmony. Um, the idea of functionality or tonal harmony is really based around the idea that you are going to start at a home base, you're going to leave from that home base, and then ultimately you're going to return to it at the very end, harmonically. So if a piece, for example, if, you know, we were writing a symphony and our symphony was in C major, that means that we're going to start the piece in C major and effectively end the piece in C major, and then we're going to go harmonically somewhere else that is not C major to make it feel as though we have journeyed past our, our realm of, of comfort. Um, that's essentially what tonality means in the, in the broadest sort of scope. Um, the one thing that I like to uh, do in terms of pointing out how harmony works is that um, there are a number of, of uh, chords when we're talking about harmony, I'm talking about the simultaneous, sound, simultaneous sounding of different pitches. Um, the harmonies have different kind of categories. They fall into four different qualities. We're not gonna talk about all the qualities. I'm really gonna talk about only two of the, the qualities that come up most often, the major chord or the major triad and the minor chord or the minor triad. Um, in any event, we have these different kinds of chord qualities and each of these chords, these uh, multiple soundings of different pitches uh, has a different kind of function. Um, some are much more stable, some, much, some are uh, much more mm, dissonant and need a kind of sense of resolution. So we have this kind of sense of tension and resolution that's built into these scales and the modes that we use in terms of um, how we construct uh, pitch relationships in a piece of music. Um, I went over a number of terms right there without defining a, a, a number of things. We're going to talk about how each of these terms works together. Um, but the subject that I'm talking about today, there's a whole other class that's dedicated to just this topic alone. It's called music theory. And at least within the music school, it happens in four sequences that takes a music major, you know, over four years of um, a pretty intense study to, to understand. Um, if you're interested in the subject, by the way, like say you um, play uh, a, an instrument just as a um, as a hobbyist, uh, there's a music fundamentals class for non-majors. It's the the class that kind of gets you into um, the beginnings of music theory, which is more or less what I'm talking about, or how how the different pitches um, relate to one another. Okay, back to my analogy. Um, so we're talking about harmony. Um, 
the simultaneous sounding of different pitches together. We usually listen to harmonies in constructions of what we call triads or uh, intervals, the, uh, the distance of, of a third apart from one another. I'll pull up a musical example of this, but um, if harmony is like baking a chocolate chip cookie, <laughs> uh, and some of you are gonna be very surprised that I'm talking about cooking once more, uh, if baking um, is, is going to be like our, our um, analogy to harmony, what's more or less happening uh, when we are uh, you know, creating a harmonic landscape for a piece of music is that we're trying to create the best cookie that we can. Um, and for those of you who have baked a cookie before, a chocolate chip cookie, hopefully you know, and this is where I wish we were in class all together, I'd ask you like, what are the ingredients in a chocolate chip cookie? So someone hopefully would say like, butter and sugar and flour and chocolate chips, of course. And eventually, eventually we would go down to the, go down through the list, you know, add vanilla and all this other stuff. One of the most important ingredients in chocolate chip cookies is actually salt. Uh, if you leave the salt out and go ahead and try it and the next time you, you bake chocolate chip cookies, you'll notice that like your chocolate chip cookies don't kind of taste as sweet as they would as if you had added salt. Um, salt in this analogy is what we call dissonance or um, chords that sound tense at like, the the, like they require some sense of resolution. Um, and by putting something salty next to something sweet, you can actually kind of draw out the flavor profile. And that's very similar to how functional harmony works. You're not just dealing with consonant harmonies, things that sound nice over and over and over again. You actually have a couple of pitfalls, like these moments of tension that you're purposefully supposed to work into points of resolution. That's what makes music um, feel good for us as listeners, is that it's this really fine balance of tension and resolution of that tension. When a composer, adds too much tension in the piece of music, like too much salt in a chocolate chip cookie, it stops tasting like dessert and tastes a little bit more, ugh, I'm not quite sure what. Um, we'll talk about that in regards to the 20th century, um, where we talk about harmony and how uh, we start to thwart it um, uh, and uh, ask, what different things can be done with the, the pitches in relationship to one another. Functional harmony is something that uh, is the foundation of any popular music that you listen to. Um, anything that's playing on the radio is functional. Most things within the, the jazz genre are also functional, especially within the jazz standard that we talked about. Um, so, Let's, let me go ahead and go over to my whiteboard so I can show you some of these ideas on a, um, on a staff. Um, one moment. Sorry about that. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna go over to my whiteboard so I can use a piece of staff paper to kind of illustrate some of these ideas that I uh, just talked about um, and that are further illustrated in the one page that I made for you. So. Give me a moment and I'll toggle over to my whiteboard. Okay, so uh, functional harmony. So functional means that we're returning to a kind of home pitch. This is actually um, already built into the, the major scale, which is the first thing that I'm going to talk about. And I'll, I'll play you an example that's uh, fairly well known from a musical that you uh, might have seen before, um, uh, The Sound of Music. So, um, major scale. Uh, so when we're talking about a major scale, I'm gonna draw it out right here, C, D, E, F, G, A, B, and then C. So um, these are the seven unique pitches with the reiteration of what we call the octave on the eighth pitch um, of the, the major scale. So this is 
scale degree one, that little caret means scale degree, the first, um, the first note of the scale, second note of the scale, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, and this is, again, the reiteration of one. Okay, awesome. So for those of you who have heard Doa Deer, um, there are solfege uh, um, names that are given to each of the pitches in a major scale. So this is, a, the first scale degree is always Do, second, Re, third, Mi, fourth, Fa, So, La, Ti, and then Do. Uh, each of these notes has a different kind of pull uh, to each other. Um, in this case, uh, T has a really strong pull, the seventh scale degree, to the reiteration of the first scale degree. And there are a couple other um, moments of kind of tension that are built in. That's usually what we, where, um, what we call the, the half steps occur in our major scale. Um, a half step uh, or a distance that we call a minor second, an interval, um, is uh, sort of the most tension ridden interval that's uh, naturally occurring on the, the piano keyboard. So there are two spots that it's built in to, um, into the actual scale itself. It's between scale degree seven and one again, um, and then it occurs again between three and four, or E and F in this case. So there are these two moments of tension um, that, are, that are built into the, the major scale. Um, wonderful. When we're talking about harmony, um, the, what, what I've written out here, of course, is, like I said, our C major scale. How do I know it's a C major scale? Well, it starts on the note C and ends on the note C. Um, and that's how we name our scales. Uh, it's the note that it starts and ends on. Um, C major scales or major scales always have the same kind of construction of what we call um, whole steps, whole steps and then half steps apart from one another. Um, so that's one of the reasons why pieces can be transposed into so many different keys uh, is because um, the relationship between note to note uh, is exactly the same even though the starting pitch will change around. Um, in a C major scale, the most important sonority, the most important chord, the most important combination of three pitches uh, are indeed spaced a third apart from one another, creating this thing called a triad. And that is between um, and among scale degree one, three, and five. One, three, five, uh, it creates a, a major chord. Um, <clears throat> uh, scale degrees one, three, and five uh, are also going to be fairly reiterated in a piece of music that you're listening to. So let's say, like I write this, this piece that I was talking about that's in C major, my, my symphony number one and it's in C major. That means proportionally, more often than any other pitch within the C major scale, we're going to listen to the note C more often than any other note. And that's how we are able to identify um, if the composer has done it correctly, the, the pitch center of the piece of music. That's what makes it so exciting when, for example, like during the development section of Sonata Allegro form, we go to a different key area. It feels like we've traveled like leaps and bounds from where we originally started. And that's a very orally exciting thing for us as listeners. Um, very good. So, Functionality, this idea of returning to our home note, our, our do. Um, at this point, I will go ahead and find the really iconic uh, song from The Sound of Music, if you don't know it, that goes through the solfege um, relationships between note to note that creates the major scale construction. Give me just one moment.
Okay, let's listen to Doe a Deer. Uh, essentially, it's going to outline just the major scale, uh, scale degrees, numbers one through seven, going through the solfege uh, and the relationship that, that happens from note to note. Again, this song, I cannot reiterate it enough, is literally just a major scale over and over again. Um, that being said, there's a lot of tension and release that's just built into the major scale itself, uh, which is why this song even works, uh, just making use of uh, one very standard construct that we listen to in music over and over again. Here we go. All right. Thanks for bearing with me on that. Um, so that's, oh no, hold on. This has been a terrible discovery on my part. Oh gosh, how and where are you playing from? Okay, I think I've saved everything. All right, awesome. No need for more of so long farewell. Um, in any event, uh, that musical example is really helpful in illustrating what exactly tonal or functional harmony means. Um, I'm gonna put a pause on this part of the lecture and definition stuff. We'll pull up a, another piece of staff paper so that I can show you what the chromatic scale is and talk about the different pitch classes that exist in music. Thanks so much, I'll see you for part two.